Today on the Geek Lab, it's 1988, the top 10 PC games of this year. And it's a corker. I've got to be honest with you, it's been really difficult selecting just 10 games from this year. I've looked at almost 80 games in total, and they've all been scorchers. But here, the very difficult decision it was, is my top 10 games of 1988. Let's start then at number 10 with this game from Houston called Nebulous. You're this little guy here called Pogo and you come out of the sea and you head into this tower. There are 8 towers in this game in total, each tower being a level and what you've got to do is you've got to jump around the tower evading all the baddies, sometimes shooting them and then getting to the top of the tower to blow it up. You look like an innocent little guy, but obviously not innocent enough to uh, hold some TNT to blow up. All in all, a very uh, artistic game for its time. There are lots of uh, great graphical effects, and if you notice, um, Pogo, your character, always sticks in the middle of the screen. So it's quite an inventive little uh, play on graphics for the time. Well playable, just a great little bit of fun. So I'm going to go in at number 9 to continue the cutesy factor with this game called Bubble Ghost. Uh, it originally came out in France by Infogrames and there are 35 levels and halls in this haunted house. Now if the bubble hits any walls or obstacles then it'll pop and you the little ghosty here loses a life. Quite how a ghost loses a life I'm not quite sure but that doesn't matter. The obstacles include lit candles, electricity and fans, of course, these can all be controlled by a ghost. I thought that ghosts couldn't touch things in the real world, but those things apparently are A-OK -okay for our little ghosty here. You can blow things, predominantly the bubble, and that will add speed and obviously you can change the angle of which you're blowing your bubble. Anyway, it's a, it's a great little cutesy game, I enjoyed it far too much than it probably should have been enjoyable but yeah that's why it's in the top 10 I, I think it's great fun do play it it looks pretty basic but definitely definitely worth a play in at number eight is a game that needs no introduction but i'll introduce it anyway here's sylphid from sierra online Despite its absolutely nonsensical storyline, in 1989 Dragon gave the DOS version of this game 5 out of 5 stars, concluding that Sylphid is a highly addictive, extremely colourful game and requires hours of enjoyable practice to master. What that basically means is, yes, like Dexter in 1987, it's nuts hard. Despite its difficulty though, you might be wondering why this features at number 8 and not something like 3, 2 or 1 on the top games of 1988. The reason, I think, is because it's a bit of pomp and circumstance. Yes, the graphics are superior, and yes, the sound is about as good as you're going to get on the ad lib card in 1988. However, I do find that if you scratch the surface of this game, it's just another shooter. In fact, if you were reading other magazines out there, such as the Electronic Gaming Monthly, you'd find that it scored a very average score. In fact, they said it was rather mundane and a simple shooter, but the gameplay is solid and the backgrounds are some of the most stunning visuals in a video game to date. However, they criticised the unimpressive bosses, the mediocre power-ups and especially the lack of interaction with the backgrounds as the game's biggest problems and I would tend to agree. In at number 7 then, I'm not sure why, but lots of the games of 1988 seem to be well, quite cutesy and this game is absolutely no exception. Barn Von Blubber has kidnapped the brothers Bubby and Bobby's girlfriends. Bad guy. Similar plot going on here, but hey. And he turned the brothers into bubble dragons, of course. Bub and Bob. Bob and Bob have to finish a hundred levels in the Cave of Monsters in order to rescue them, of course. So, yep, yeah, basically you're this little character, you go about, uh, you blow bubbles, something similar around bubbles in this year as well. Um, and yeah, and you blow up these baddies and, well, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's very addictive, it's arcade gameplay uh, from Japan, so you know that it's going to be a good one. The next game in our review is Manhunter New York. 
this by Sierra Online is not different to the other adventure games that came before it because it used the Adventure Game Interpreter or AGI. But what they did with AGI in this game is stripped out the Command Interpreter so you don't have to type in things like Look Room, Look Table and so forth. All of it was moved about by the cursor and it had various different controls, kind of like what was happening in the LucasArts or LucasFilm games of the time. You play a manhunter. Now the manhunters are employed by these orbs. The orbs took over the earth in 2002 as the story goes and you as a manhunter have got to track down criminals who could be doing nefarious things against the will of the orbs. Now you've got this device called the MAD and the MAD is a computer that allows you to track the transponders installed in every single human being. It's a very interesting adventure game. There are lots of gory pictures, gory details. It's kind of detective based, but then it's kind of uh, puzzle based as well. There's lots of different puzzle artifacts into the game, which cause it to be, well, in some cases, very frustrating. But in other cases, it's quite good sort of arcade fun. I do love the EGA graphics, I think the artwork in this game is some of the best in one of the AGI games by Sierra, and I have to say though, the puzzles in this game are incredibly frustrating, and that's probably its biggest downfall. Now just be aware, I'm going to cheat now. So yes, I'm cheating. Three games in one, Police Quest 2, The Vengeance, Leisure Suit Larry 2, Looking for Love in Several Long Places, and Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. All three fantastic games, uh, none of which are absolutely breakthrough titles. If you recall, we had Leisure Suit Larry 1 in 1987, we had Police Quest 1, as well as LucasArts, Maniac Mansion. So these were all continuations of a theme that was created the year before. However, all three games were absolutely fantastic and none of them deserved to be forgotten about. 1988, the Bitmap Brothers burst into the scene with this one called Speedball. The idea is that you play one of two teams and on an enclosed court with a goal at each end of it, similar to ice hockey or a five-a-side football. Gameplay is extremely fast-paced and the player has control of only one outfield player on a team at one time. As the game progresses, coins and several power-ups appear randomly, which can be collected. Power-ups include making the ball become electrified. Let's just summarize this game by saying the only game that exceeded the quality of this game in its genre is Speedball 2. Well, the next game, let's just put it this way. If you wanted to play a game where you were a mutant lizard, gorilla, or a werewolf, and you wanted to climb buildings, and pound them to rubble, as well as eat humans, ping pong with trains, and smash helicopters, amongst many other nasty things, then of course you've come to the right game here with Rampage. The game's lead developers were not fans of arcade games at the time, and they conceived Rampage as a game where it had no wrong way to play. In the end, this game is just a bit of good fun. You smash up buildings, you eat people, all of those great things. I could play it for absolutely hours and hours and hours, and it brings back so many great memories from 1988. That's Rampage. This next game is totally triumphant, dudes. It's California Games by Epix. There's a whole bunch of events, six of them to be precise, half pipe, foot bag, roller skating, surfing, flying disc, and BMX. Now when I was a kid when I first played this, I had never heard of, well, pretty much all of them. And that was okay, I figured out that flying disc was actually frisbee. I had played all the other Epix games like Winter Games and Summer Games, but California Games was totally different. 
And even if you had a CGA computer, which most of the time meant that you had only four colours in your palette to play for, you were in for a little treat. This game could make seven colours appear as if by magic, using a very, very clever programming technique. The programming overall though was incredibly good for its time because it was extremely fast gameplay and it was extremely addictive as well. To the naked eye you would be excused for saying some of the events looked a little bit lacklustre. I'm looking at your footbag. But it doesn't matter because actually all of them are really really good fun. You don't have to have any ability sports wise to enjoy mashing your keyboard or your joystick along to the many great events in this game. To be honest with you there isn't anything I could really fault this about. The graphics are lovely, they're bright and the gameplay is fantastic and the sound even though it comes out of the PC speaker does everything it needs to do. It's a top version and a top game. And now it's time to come to the very last game of 1988. Number one position goes to Accolades Grand Prix Circuit. Unlike Test Drive from the last year which wasn't exactly a simulation, Formula 1 racing is recreated in detail in this simulation. You have the choice to derive a Ferrari 187-88C, a McLaren MP4-4 or a Williams FW12, each with different qualities. Rival drivers also have their own styles and strengths and to win the world championship you have to master these. Pit stop timing and planning is crucial as well, although only tyres are changed in the late 1980s F1. You can choose whether to drive a single race at Brazil, Britain, Monaco, Western Germany, which is Hockenheim, Canada, Italy, Detroit and Japan, or to drive a full championship on every track. Every race includes a qualifying round. For me, I can't tell you why Formula 1 Grand Prix circuit hits the spot but for me it was just one of those games that always kept me coming back for more. I had to hone my skills just a little bit more to get around those circuits and playing this game on any other difficulty other than beginner rookie was, uh, was a little bit tricky. I, I really couldn't get past the rookie level. It's a really good simulation. The sound wasn't too irritating. The graphics were pretty good but the gameplay is where it was all at with this game. I absolutely love it. And there you go, that's all my games from 1988. What did you think of my suggestions? Literally so many of those games that didn't make the cut. And really, I do feel that it was unfair to most of them. It was a very, very big haul of games to get through. And so many of them were absolutely wonderful titles. So that's it. Again, thank you very much for watching. I would so appreciate it if you could get onto my Patreon website. That's patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. Chuck me a wee donation. If you do like what I do, please hit that subscribe button and like the video. I really do appreciate your subscriptions because it makes me know that what I'm doing is worthwhile. Well, that's about it for this time. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for 1989.